TFH Natomas, super honored to be here with you today. Thank you for the worship, everyone back there. Uh, man, yeah, that was one of my brothers up here, and we've been brothers our whole lives, you know. It was unfortunate for him, I know, but, you know, we, we survived somehow. And uh, Pastor Matt's my older brother, obviously, and it's been an honor to be a part of carrying a legacy that has been set for us. When before we could even walk, before we could speak, that there was some someone laying that foundation for us. Uh, man, we uh, thank you for calling me young man too. Oh, well, cool. Yeah, I'm getting getting close to forty. I know. Believe it or not, the Filipino blood kind of kicks in. They used to say that when I was a kid. They're like, when you get older, it's gonna be good that you look young. I'm like, okay. So I guess it helps out now. So here we are. I'm excited to share with you uh, just. I don't consider myself much of a preacher. I think, if anything, more of a storyteller. I'm not that great at preaching, but I like to tell stories. I like to tell stories. I like to listen to stories. I, I think about stories all day long. Ask my wife, I'm usually getting distracted by something random while she's trying to tell me about something super important. It's because I'm imagining a story. I'm like, what's going on? Wow. You know, I get lost really easy in my head. The story I want to share with you today the way I'm going to share with you is probably in a way that I'm going to bet you've never heard before. And it's not because of who I am. It's not because of, I, of, of all my experience or gifts or talents. It's because the same work that God is doing in this church is the same work he's doing in me. A work of healing, restoration, transformation, and drawing individuals closer to himself. And before I get into it, I uh, want to show you this video. It's one of the classic movies that we used to watch growing up as kids. Check out this clip. Give me one more. Look, one more. The name of that movie is Chet Stedman. I pretty much have that whole movie memorized line for line, by the way. Uh, my brother and I, we quote quotes from that movie back and forth all the time. And when you see us cracking up, we're probably quoting uh, a movie line, so you should be aware of that. You can join in if you want, but if you don't want to, that's okay, too. Chet Stedman, he's in this, this such an important game, the championship. And first of all, the, the coach, a.k.a. manager, he puts him into pitch, even though... 
he had shown that he was declining as a pitcher. He had not been pitching well at all. That's where Henry, the kid, ri rising star, came in and kind of started to bring the team back up to par and to even have a shot at being one of the best. Puts him in this game, and then he's, his arm is, in, is going out. Once again, he's in pain. Chet, he had been having these problems. He's feeling the pain, and he says, Coach, give me one more. Give me one more. Remember those words from his manager. He's like, I'm going to take you out. That's what he said right before the clip started. He said, give me one more. Right, his raspy voice, sweat dripping. Give me one more. And the question I have for you this morning is, what is your one more? What is your one more step? What is your one more mission? What is your one more assignment? What is your one more word that God has given you? Maybe you came in here today and you're like, I have no clue. I just came because my brother invited me. Maybe you're here, you're like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to make my wife happy. <laughs> Maybe. But if you're in that position, I believe today, here, within these next two hours, no, I'm just kidding. God is going to give you a one more, but it's going to be up to you to run with it. What is your one more? What is your next step? This message is for those of you who came in here and you have secrets. <gasps> secrets. You have struggles. Oh, welcome. Welcome right to the family. We've all got struggles. But here's, here's the thing that keeps us in our struggles, one of the things. We hide them. And we tell ourselves, as long as we hide them, we'll be okay. We can get by and we'll still do pretty good. Hey, we'll, do, we'll, we'll, we'll answer God's call in our lives. Uh, we'll, we'll get some stuff done. You know, we'll, we'll excel in our career. You know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get straight A's if you're, if you're like in, in college or high school or something. Or if, you, or if you're older, you're like, I'll show up to work on time every single day. Whatever that looks like for you, we'll tell ourselves these things, right, that we can control. Oh, but this part of my life, I, I don't need to tell anyone. And the way I'm going to do this today, this message is for those of you who have a struggle that you're afraid of and that you have kept to yourself and that you're embarrassed about. And as a result, you are allowing that struggle to be your boss. You're allowing that struggle to tell you how to live. You're allowing that struggle to interrupt your schedule. You're allowing that struggle to determine how you relate or don't relate in your relationships. You're allowing that struggle to keep you at a distance from God. And this is how I'm going to do it. Today, I'm going to take 10 steps on the off chance that you would take one. Because that's my mission. I'm not here to talk so much about you. I want to talk about me. That's my mission. That's what God's called me to do. So it goes like this. I want a divorce, he told her, via text message. How did he get here? Why did he get here? Seven years old, he had his first Sunday school crush. He had rosy cheeks, glowing brown eyes, his cute smile. Hair that ballroom danced to the rhythm of her graceful footsteps. Then he wished he were Zach Moritz. Due to his fascination with Kelly Kapowski. Yeah, some of you remember Saved by the Bell. And then when it was the ultimate book of J.C. Penny ads and racy TV show scenes his mind would sit on. Can't forget the Pink Ranger, Amy Jo Johnson. God bless her. He remembers that day when he peered outside the front house window, one hand guiding the weightless curtain just to double check no one was home. It was he in a world that would widen his web of fantasy, pornography, compliments of Hugh Hefner's legacy, types and feels emotions he'd never felt prior, high-quality X-rated images glare from this 16-inch screen. And from that moment on a Dow desktop, his curiosity would constantly pop off with imaginations. His body tingles as his outrageous feeling breakdances through his brain. He was diving into a jacuzzi that could only fit him in a screen because, hear me, lust will make room for everyone. Just not your family or your friends and not for real intimacy. 
He knew what was wrong, but didn't understand that lust is a liar that will claim to serve you, but in the end, you will bow shamefully and call it silent. From that point on, he forgot how to see, how to do daily life without feeding on this fantasy, how to appreciate female beauty without the hypersexuality. And every attractive lady became an object of sexual stimuli. He becomes super glued to one part of her being while her true beauty was like a lost loved one. He just couldn't see it. Fast forward to the invention of smartphones. Leading to more frequent dumb actions, a young man very much in love with Jesus, but still distracted by this secret addiction. And now he's 19. I guess that's his young adult, but he is very much still a child with this insatiable appetite to explore a lustful realm that never keeps its promises. Because lust promises everything. But it never keeps that promise. Always starts off innocently, doesn't it? Once upon a time, maybe when he was age eight or seven, having a crush on a girl didn't mean he craved her. It actually meant he admired her person, you know, her smile, her laugh, her humor, without it resulting this, in this cycle of addiction. Then at age 23, he meets an angel for his first time. They first met officially at the Sacramento, California, Capitol Building. It was a crisp fall season day as the sun beamed and lit her brown hair that flowed like calm waves. The pink in her sweater smelled like Victoria's Secret. He was certain, though, she was several feet away. Stunned by her smile, entrapped by the purity of her person, and two years later they married. She will solve my lust problem, he was too certain. But after just three months of marriage, there he lie yet again in the middle of the night surfing the same safari, consuming the same poisonous apple on his brand new iPad. Poisonous apple iPad. I'll never do it again, he told her and himself as she held her face in tears, broken, knowing the man she trusted with her whole heart would betray her by longing for women that were not meant for him. The till death do us part guy was slowly, emotionally killing the queen. He gave that vow to tears, grazing her cheeks as they left her eyes. She asked why, his heart pounding, sweat dripping as he saw she found the sights on his device. I'll never do it again, he said, because it hurt her. But just a month later, there he was yet again drooling over a device while she slept late at night. Could it be his longing, gazing, craving after craving for image after image, trained his spirit to do the same to his wife and just swipe up to move on to the next image? Because that's when spiritual death made him part from her after five years of marriage and two daughters later. I want a divorce, he said. Through text messages of all places, what a fool, right? An incredible wife, two amazing kids. I mean, treasure is what people search for, not what they get rid of. I want a divorce, I told myself. <laughs> I never use that line. But I came this morning to be honest with you and tell you this story is mine. You see, there was once a time with the woman I dreamt of when I was just a boy. She didn't have to have perfect lips, eyes, or shaped hips. Sure, she was modest but beautiful. Humble but confident, hopefully a little shorter than I. But one time, the woman of my dreams, she didn't have to give in to my every wish. She'd argue with my logic. Because I didn't dream of one who only came to life with a swipe, a tap, a click. I dreamt of one with a heartbeat. Not someone I could control on a whim, but someone to breathe real life with. Yet this digital drug trained my brain to never be satisfied with one. So I want a divorce. It didn't start in my 20s. Started as young as age 10. And not with the woman of my dreams, but the ones of my fantasy. I drooled over tight jeans, couldn't comprehend that wasn't his purpose for crafting her jeans, because he's a genius. Far too brilliant to create a being fully accessible through one tap or click. And then age 27, separated from my wife, I was walking into the biggest setup of my life. And if I could title it, I would borrow the scripture from James. It says, confess your sins one to another, pray for one another that you may be healed. Honesty overtook me. Transparency swept my heart into the reality God made me for. For the first time, Mark admitted his weaknesses and found strength through that. Because if you walk out of a dim room and into the sunlight and then back into the dim room, you then realize how dark that dim room was. But if you stay in the dim room too long, your vision can readjust to the darkness. But I won't let my vision readjust because I love freedom too much. You see, I followed through with divorce. But I didn't divorce my wife. I divorced my counterfeit life. 
I filed for divorce from my old man and my old ways because even while I was lost in my circular maze, God took my hand. He said, son, I'm with you always. Yes, he took my hand. I like to claim that I'm a grown man, but I still have a little boy heart who desperately needs his father. My wife has been a reflection of Christ. To many, she should have given up on me, but she would pray and God would tell her, be still. And she did. She would. Lust and illusion built upon fantasy, and for so long it felt like freedom was my fantasy. You know, something that looks so amazing, but you could never really get. Well, finally, everything has changed, and I'm now celebrating over seven years of freedom from my addiction. I can say to you this morning that freedom is my reality. My fear, guilt, shame told me that I couldn't break free from the lie. But it was my fear, my guilt, and shame that were lying to me the whole time. Telling me that, that I, I, I couldn't be anything more than I was. That I had to struggle forever, which is a common one I hear so often. Oh, yeah, you're just going to have to struggle like that forever. I disagree. If we say with God all things are possible, I think it's time to start believing with God all things are possible. And if we say, oh, I'm just supposed to be this way forever, we've already given up on the way he wants to lead us to break through. And maybe this morning that's not your struggle. Fine, praise God, you're blessed. <laughs> but you've got something else you're struggling with. Maybe it's, maybe it's taking a little bit too much of that medication to the point that it's addicting. Maybe it's maybe it's a, a, a habit. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe you're just like, man, why am I talking mess about the pastor again? I don't even know why. Just blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> My mouth just goes. You're creative with that gossip, huh? We have different struggles. But within that struggle, what is your next step? What is God saying to you today? What's he telling you is your one more? What is your one more? I want to give you some steps that I talk with guys about all the time. And steps that, they're so simple. It's not, it's not like huge. It's not, you know, you don't have to take a college course and enroll in a program to learn these steps. You can walk them out if you have the courage. Number one, if you want to outgrow your struggle, the hardest thing I could do was I had to confess. James says this, right, 516, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. James 516, and, you know, we, we, I thought about that scripture a lot. I heard it all the time. I was like, confess, okay, confess. So I'll just confess to God. <laughs> it's more comfortable, right? It's easier. Oh, I don't have to tell my husband about that, you know, it, it'll be all right. Let me just keep it to myself this time. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't got to tell anybody. I don't, I don't have to tell my small group that, that I'm struggling. I'm drinking too much late at night when I go. I don't have to open up about that. Let's just keep it to myself. Me and God will deal with it together. But the scripture tells us to confess, and there's a reason. Something powerful happens. And I'm talking to you as a church kid. I hid this struggle for so much of my life, most of my life. This was a struggle for me. Even though I'm getting older, still, most of my life, I lived with this struggle. Thinking I could never be free. When I first got into that group, I remember, man, I was so nervous, so scared. Any introverts here? Thank you, I'm not alone. You must all be introverts because you didn't raise your hand. I was so scared to get in that small group, right? Um, the leader, his name was Ben. Ben was a licensed therapist, all that good stuff. I was driving out to Rockland from, like, wherever we were living at the time. We lived all over the place. I don't want to tell you where we lived before, but <laughs> excuse me. That was a laugh slash, you know, just stuck in my throat. Um, so, so I go there. I meet Ben for the first time, and there are, like, three other white dudes, right? Ben was a white dude, too. Nothing against white people at all. I love my white folks, okay? Be clear. I just... I just want you to know sometimes when it's I'm the only different one, it just feels different, you know, because 
am I going to be okay? You know, are they going to accept me? Kind of a little bit of that. Um, so Ben's leading this group, and I'm like, oh, shoot. And then the guys start sharing. They're, like, just checking in, sharing their updates. He's like, yeah, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with the lust, and I'm seeing things online. I'm like, oh, no. This is my first time just seeing other people, like, talk about it. I'm like, this happens somewhere in the world. <laughs> and that was my turn, right? Now I'm sweating. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, my name is Mark. Good to meet you guys. You know, my marriage is struggling, and I told them my story, told them about my struggles. And it was so freeing. And the first few times it was scary. It was uncomfortable because it was new. It was foreign to me. But it started to become, actually become something I enjoyed. And I kept going to that group each week. Every Monday night, 45 minutes one way to Rockland, 45 minutes to get home. It was my Monday routine. And I kept going to that group week after week for two years. I could count on one hand the number of times I missed that group. And the reason I was so consistent is because I was tired of struggling the way I had been for so much of my life. Well, at first, it was because my wife told me, hey, you've got you to get some help. Like, <laughs> but then it changed. It, I was like, I like Ben. Ben's cool. Not just because he's shorter than me, but, you know, he's a cool. He's helping. He's encouraging the bro, you know. And then we had some new guys join in, so we had five white brothers in the group. It was cool. But these dudes were legit. They were so real, and they helped uplift me in a way I didn't even think was possible. But it would not have happened if I didn't say, okay, I'm going to stop hiding, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk. I'm going to communicate. And there, there was no wrong thing to say in that group. There was, there was no, no, one, no one shocked at what you were struggling. No one was like, oh, my gosh. You're, wow. You're so messed up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you're, you're a sad case. Wow, dude. <laughs> we can't help you, bro. <laughs> no. I think you should go to a different church. <laughs> there was love. There was grace. But also there was space to really process and talk through what was happening. Because something happens when you actually say something out loud. You ever experienced that? Some of you may have experienced that. Others of us, maybe we experienced that on a lighter level. Like, you know, when you're looking for your keys. And suddenly when you say you're looking for your keys, I'm like, oh, yeah. Lighter example, right? What if you took that to a deeper level in your life by applying what James says? Confess your sins. It's scary, I know, man. It's uncomfortable. But what kind of potential might await you in the future? I can talk all day about about what I do with my life now. It's like people ask me what I do for a living. I'm like, everything. (laughs) I dream, I write, I I do spoken word. I preach at my brother's church um, sometimes. And um, I sell houseplants. Not that kind. (laughs) Every time we say that, it's like everybody's like, Wait, 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 wait. I didn't say cannabis, okay? I said house plants. Like, come on, y'all. Jeez. People are, in, you're intelligent. You're made in God's image. You know. Anyways. Yeah, I sell some plants from home, so if you're, you know, into the plant. Anyways, guys. <laughs> Confess. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you will find mercy. Hide your sins, you'll not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you'll find mercy. It doesn't say you'll find embarrassment, you'll find more shame, and you'll find God putting you down and scolding you and slapping you. You'll find mercy. That is the God we serve. That's the God we follow, the God that when you fall and scrape your knee, he says, I got you, get up, hey. Hey, let me help you make sure you get better. He he doesn't say, oh, you're tough, you can handle it by yourself. He has you, and he's not afraid of your struggle. He's not embarrassed of you. I think maybe there some sometimes we feel embarrassed. <laughs> there was this one lady, because I sell these shirts. Um, I'm not trying to advertise the shirts I'm selling, but it says, <laughs> it says Jesus, right? And she looked at it, and she was like, oh, it says Jesus. Oh, and she put it back. She was like, I'm not ready to wear that. It's like, okay, expect, I, I. I appreciate the realness, but sometimes we feel like, oh, I'm not worthy. Who says that? Who told you that? And why do you believe that? So we can say we believe one thing, but the truth about what we believe is how we're living. 
Do you know what that means? It means there are some lies that are lingering that need to be identified and that you need to invite God's truth to intersect with so those lies can be defeated in your life. That's what happened for me. I knew the truth logically, but I didn't know it relationally. I knew the logic. I knew the textbook version because I'd memorized the scriptures. Hey, I had a love chapter memorized, right? Remember mama used to make us memorize all those like chapter long memory verses in our school. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know it based on relationship. What's your one more? What's your next step? I remember I was 19. <sighs> I'm not proud of different parts of my story. I'm not proud of all of this. It's not like a badge of honor. I'm like, oh, I did this, I did that. You know, talking with the boys at the bar or whatever. No, I don't even go to bars. But there's one part of my story, and, and I was like, uh, I was 19 years old, and and I got, I'm still uncomfortable sometimes, but I, I just feel like, again, my mission is to tell you, take 10 steps, so maybe you take one. Um, I got involved with a married woman, 19 years old, pastor's kid, knew the scripture was good. Served in the church. The secrets accumulated in my life and progressed in that way for me. You're like, how, oh, what? That doesn't make sense. And people looked at me like, oh, that's a good kid. We want our kids to be like him. But I share this with you because, one, I want you to know that you are not the only one who's struggling with whatever your struggle. But number two, no matter how bad that struggle is, there is breakthrough for you. There's breakthrough for you. There's healing for you. There's restoration for you. The hard part is it's usually the thing we're most afraid of that we need to do. <laughs> I didn't want to talk, right? I didn't want to confess. I didn't want to reach out to anybody. It, God was telling me, wake up, Mike, get up, time to do it. And I remember somehow during that time I actually, <laughs> in front of my dad's church, like somehow confessed this to everybody at church. I was like, why am I doing this right now? I don't know, but I'm 19 and I guess I'm a kid, so let me try this out. And I did that, and it was a great service. The spirit was in the place. People were experiencing restoration. People were in tears. And Yet months later, the struggle came back again. And temptation, I'm back online and on websites and whatever else I could find. And what I realized as I'm reflecting back is Confession wasn't meant to be a one-time event, but an ongoing conversation. It's not a one-time event where you got your medal. I confess, guys, I'm all good for the rest of my life. That's great. <laughs> I've been restored. I'm good. It's an ongoing conversation for us fellow humans. Because for the rest of our lives, we're going to have some type of struggle. Whether it's with, with, a, with, with a, it could be anxiety and depression could be other types of struggles. It could be a fear that we just kind of kept inside. It's not kind of like locked in. That we've never really dealt with before, never really faced. It's an ongoing conversation. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So a man or woman sharpens the countenance of his or her friend. Who is your iron? They could be your steamer if you want. My wife bought a steamer recently. I was like, wow, this works great. Who is yours? Two are better than one, right? The scripture tells us these things. We're like, but oh, I go to church. That's it. But do you let the church in? You're around the body, but are you with? And I say this because I grew up around the body of Christ all the time. But I didn't let them in. I was afraid. I was scared. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm just dying. It's okay. Iron sharpens iron. Tell someone next to you, you look sharp. <laughs> My dad has always said that growing up. You look sharp. <laughs> He would be here, but he's in the Philippines. He uh, messaged me on Facebook last night. Keep my dad in prayer. He's getting good at Facebook. Oh, man. It's going to be interesting. 
He's 70, so I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's like, you're preaching this Sunday, TFH? I'm like, yeah. He's like, send me the message. Like, All right, fine. Number two, and I promise I'm not going to be too much longer. Number two, the step you need to take if you want to outgrow your struggle. Clarify. I'm giving you a few C's. One is confess. Two is clarify. Clarify the reason for your struggle. Proverbs 4, 7 says this. Wisdom is the principal thing. One of my favorites. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get an understanding. I like this one. You know your struggle, but do you understand it? You know your habit, you know your addiction, but do you understand? Well, well yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I drink too much Dos Equis. Um, I, I, I drink the, the no, 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 I, I, I don't know what they're called. Obviously, I, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> look, look, look. Substance, substance was never my thing. Um, I've never smoked a cigarette before, I know. I know I'm a, I'm a child in some ways still, hopefully. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't know what they're called. But do you understand the why? Do you understand the roots? You see the plant, right? Again, it's not that kind of plant. Um, but do you know what's going on in the roots? And as someone who sells plants, this is something we say so often, and people will ask me, hey, my leaves, the leaves are like droopy on my plant. And I'll say, did you check the roots? Oh, I have a lot of yellowing here. The leaves are looking crispy. Like, is my plant dying? Look at the roots. Have you checked your <laughs> roots? There's a gentleman named John. I had the honor to, I've had the honor of coaching like a few hundred men over the past four or so years. And uh, who knew, you know, this, right? Shy, quiet dude, as my brother introed, and I didn't get, hear everything, but I, I assumed he said something like that. Um, <laughs> uh, who knew that this quiet dude, right, would have so much to say? But one of the guys who is a pastor on staff, his name is John, and I've been working with him for actually a few years. We've met like every other week or so, sometimes phone calls, sometimes in person, and um, he was struggling. He was struggling. His, uh, his pastor didn't know about his struggle at length. Uh, a lot of people just did not know. I was the first person that he first shared and opened up to. And at first, he was afraid to tell me how his struggle had progressed. So he just started with, oh, I'm just struggling with looking at websites and, you know, porn online and stuff. I'm like, okay, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Eventually, he found the courage to open up and say, you know, I actually struggle in other ways that I haven't told you about. And uh, Pastor John, we can call him, he was, he was struggling with, uh, with meeting up with these women from, from his past when he was, uh, before he, he met Christ. He was, he was struggling with just going back to these women who were just available for him. He would just text them, was like, man, John, wow, okay. I mean, you're, you're not a bad looking guy or anything, but I just didn't know that'd be you. But anyways, he's, he's struggling with this, going, going back to his past, just calling and tugging at him over and over. And we would have these sessions. We would meet together. But over time, and it took time of him going back to this conversation of not just managing the behavior, because we did all the things. We could have done all those things like, oh, yeah, set up the, set up the browser, browser blocker, delete numbers, and, and block numbers. We did all that, but there's always a workaround, right? It's like you, you can always find it again somehow. You, you can always go back with a click or borrow someone else's device or something or go to the library. Some people did that. But for John, when he began to identify and understand the roots, and I encouraged him to see a, a, a counselor who specialized in, in trauma work. But if, if some, many of us knew John and we just heard, oh, Pastor John's struggling. Wow, he shouldn't be. You know, sometimes people can think this way, like, you shouldn't be pastoring, you shouldn't be teaching, you shouldn't be serving. And there can be some truth in that where you get a period of restoration, right, and, and healing and growth, and then you become better equipped to serve at that level. I understand that. But a lot of times there can be more of this, uh, this, this judgment from the Christian community when we see someone struggles a certain way. But let me tell you a little bit more about John's struggle, about John's roots. When John was just about seven, six, seven years old, his dad 
would put him and his sister in a room on a bed, and he would watch them perform acts on each other. So eventually they got older, his sister got older, and she didn't want to do that anymore. So what happened was John started to turn to other women who would be available. And what we identified was that starting from that young, John had created this uh, this unhealthy attachment with his sibling, an attachment he was not meant for, but that he was attempting to relive over and over again. Over and over again through these women looking for his sister. Looking for the only comfort he knew and what he was taught by his own dad was good. Over and over again. But we began to address the roots. We're like, John, this is going to be uncomfortable, bro, but I'm gonna, we're, we're, we're going to pull this out, okay? We're, we're, we're going to check, check it out. Yeah, you got some roots that are rotting, bro, so what we're going to do, we're going to trim those off. See, when you address the roots, you can start to trim, trim away the dead parts. And what you usually have to do is plant, replace the plant in a new, new soil, whatever medium you're placing it in. And as it's nurtured and taken care of properly, it'll grow new roots. Today, John is experiencing next level breakthrough. He's actually helping lead men in the ministry I started today. <laughs> if you have the courage to go back to your roots, breakthrough's not just for me, it's not just for John, it's not just for a select few, it's for all God's people. Just because you're here today, you're not here because you have to be perfect. If you were perfect, you wouldn't have to be here at all. Like, don't come to church. You're already perfect. <laughs> we look up to you. You teach. <laughs> we're here because we are. We're broken people. Learning to live the way Jesus meant for us to live. Growing every day a little bit closer. We make mistakes along the way. Yeah, sometimes I got a poopy attitude with my wife. Yeah, sometimes I, I shut down my daughter's feelings when she needs my sensitivity. Yes, I still have to learn to relate to them better as they're getting older. I'm like, she was daddy's girl. Where are you? Where are you, girl? Right here somewhere. <laughs> right there. This is my family right here. Can you raise your hand real quick? My girls. <laughs> yeah. I still got work to do. But it's not based on shame. It's based on the love of God. Because when you realize how loved you are, you want to grow every day. When you realize how accepted you are, repentance isn't so much work. It's like, wow, I get to repent. I get a chance to turn away from what I was doing. I get a chance to grow. That's the God I serve. He gives me another chance and another chance. That's who he is. Will you have the courage to go to the roots? I thought for so long, you know, my struggle started when I was first on that Dow desktop computer with that dial-up internet connection. I was way too slow, yet somehow I had patience. Waited. No, but it was even before that. Sorry, Ma, I love you, but she, I, I don't know if she knew this, but <laughs> uh, when I was, when I was like, again, like, I don't know, six, seven so I, I developed this infatuation with quarters. Yeah, I love quarters. My dad would come home from work every day, and he had this routine, right? Empty out his pockets, empty out the snot wipes, the business cards, the receipts, and whatever else, the lint, candy. No, he didn't really have candy. And he would just stack it on his, uh, they called the chest of drawers, his dresser. Solid oak dresser that, I don't know what happened to it, probably just got rid of it because it was ugly. He stacked everything there, and then when he the, the room was clear, coast was clear, I was going, and I was like, yeah, any quarters? Well, only pennies today. Damn. Check again. Oh, we got two quarters today. But you know what I would do? I wouldn't take it all, right, because that would be too obvious. I would take just enough so that you couldn't notice anything was missing. I remember we went to uh, a friend's house. We stayed the night somewhere. I don't remember where it was, Mike, but it was like a friend's house, and... 
and, and I was in the room somehow by myself, and it was like quarter heaven. There were quarters all over this dresser. It was like there were so many that I could take a stack, a whole handful, and no one notice. So I did. Swipe some quarters. And so here's what God was showing me is that over time, it wasn't just me being exposed to certain types of content online. That was part of it. Part of it was my own choices. A big part of it. And what I learned from those childhood memories of taking a little so no one would notice is I learned that if I just take a little bit, it won't hurt anyone. If I just take a little bit, no one will know. No one has to know because it's not that bad. So guess what happened when I found pornography online? Oh, it's not that bad. It's not that much. It doesn't happen that often. Yet it progressed because a little is just too much. A little is too much. What's your next step? What's your one more time? Number three is this, and this is where it gets fun. Conquer. The third and final C is conquer. This is where you live out your purpose. But you have to do the other two to get here. You could still do a lot of good things. And you could still have this living out your purpose to some degree. Do a lot of great work. People do a lot of great work while still having secrets in their life. But you can't fully get there because you're still carrying this secret weight. Third is conquer. And this is the fun part because this is where you become so fueled by what you were made to do. That what used to distract you isn't even a threat. I can go to hotel rooms around the country and sometimes speak and share. And I w I've been around the country touring and all that. And I remember the first time going to a hotel room by myself. I was like, oh, no. I hope I don't uh, get tempted. And, and I was communicating with my wife. I was like, babe, I'm by myself. She was a little nervous. I was a little nervous. I was in the East Coast by myself. I got there and then I went to sleep. <laughs> Woke up. I'm like. I'm good. Hey, babe, I'm good. <laughs> I never went back. Thankfully, by God, yes, it was a step-by-step -step process, but I found this new rhythm, and it started to walk in my purpose, and I was like, wait, this is what I was missing out on this whole time. I was missing out on my purpose. My down moments were squandered. My alone time was squandered. It was wasted, but now I get to use it for something that I can smile about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about what I did last night. Wouldn't that be a good feeling? I enjoy knowing that I can be home alone and like be like, I like my peace. <laughs> I, like my, I like my silence. Look at my plants and I water them and stuff. This is great. This is the life. Thank you, God. Wow. It's not a threat anymore. Do I still have to apply the tools I did in the beginning? Yeah, of course. I meet with guys all the time. Guess what? That helps me too. Because I'm communing with them where I am currently. And it continues to help me moving forward. So I'm getting ready to close here. There's, there's, a, there's a movie uh, called Hook. It's another classic one. And <laughs> a character named Rufio, right? And it's the scene where Robin Williams comes flying in. He finally realizes and remembers he's Peter Pan. Rufio's like in awe, like he has no words. He's just like... Robin Williams swoops down and then slices, I don't know, his, his belt, Rufio's belt, and then his pants fall down. Uh, he has these red tights, right? Yeah, he doesn't care. He's just standing there in his underwear. Because he's so in awe of the one he'd been waiting for. So in awe of the one he knew would lead them to where they needed to be. What if we could live so in awe of who our creator is? That our struggles just became so much smaller. That what we thought was unbearable, now we realize, wow, that wasn't as big as I thought it was. When I responded to his word. I showed you a clip in the beginning as I started out here today um, of Chet Stedman. Classic movie, Rookie of the Year. And he said, give me one more. But he wasn't the only one who gave it one more shot. I've always had a cat in my life, right? We're my cat lovers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We had a couple of us. All right, that's our small group now. From now on, there aren't too many of us left, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Dogs are all the business these days. 
Um, I have a cat right now in my life, of course. But the cat before this, <laughs> his name was Chilsey. I named him that because he was like chill. His personality, he just chill. I would try to play with him, he would just chill. Like he just like, <laughs> just when he was a kitten, he just chill there. I'm like, okay, don't play. But his sister was very playful. And we had him for a long time. About, man, what, three? Wait, I put it down here. All right, April 5th, 2022. One of my childhood cats, it was Chelsea, he came home. Came home one more time. Interesting thing is he was gone for like two, three years. Nobody saw him. We're like, maybe he just passed somewhere. Didn't know where he was. One day, my brother, Pastor Matt, he sends me a text message. He was like, look who came home. Chelsea looked super scrawny and raggedy because he'd lived life. He lived a full life. He used to leave dead birds on the lawn, unfortunately. But he lived a full life. I picked him up. I took him home. I was like, oh, he's home. But he was so weak, he would, like, even shake as he's standing. He was scrawny. I gave him a bath. He was with me for, like, three days. And after three days, after I gave him that bath, in the backyard, he walked to the corner, found this spot in the grass where the sun was shining. I went inside the house, and I came back in a few minutes to check on him. And uh, he had stopped breathing. Chelsea's one more time was just being home. Just coming home. To be with his master, his dad, his owner, whatever you want to call me. Even after being lost for so long. The average outdoor cat lives two to five years. Chelsea lived over 22 years. That was my boy. <laughs> Chelsea came home. I was his one more time. What's your one more time? May 2023. My mom came home one more time. Left the job she loved, left the state she loved, the community she built in a new place. It took her years to establish. She excelled in her career like she did in everything she did. She came home one more time. She came one more time, one more time for her family, one more time for her kids. She said, I don't want to miss another birthday. One more time for her CFH family. She wanted to help you guys with the church. She wanted to teach again. That was her one more time. We had her for a couple months here. What's your one more time? What's your one more time? We don't get forever here. I know the day-to-day -day gets mundane and, and doing the same thing every day, taking your kids to school, running around, and we kind of forget the eternal value of everything we do. What's God telling you here one more time is will you respond? If you struggle like I did, take one step. Start with one. Don't worry about the other ten. Just take one. The next one will follow. God will provide that. Maybe your one next step is a small group. Maybe your one next step is seeing a counselor for some of the struggles you're dealing with. Maybe you need to get connected with my ministry. We'd love to have you. If you had one more, what would it be? I decided that I would start preaching like it was my one more. That every time I had a chance to share, I would share like it's my one more. So today, this is my one more. God, all glory always goes to your name. Thank you that you are present with us even when we don't believe you are. I still get scared. I still get sad. I feel off some days. But there are also many days I know that you're there, that you're right there. We have broken pieces represented in this place. And if not with the individuals here today, maybe we represent someone who is in that broken place where they are stuck in a cycle. Maybe they were stuck in a cycle of shame. 
a sinful cycle that is draining their spirit, that was draining them emotionally, mentally, God. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you would be welcomed. That you would be welcomed by the ones who have been resistant. That you would be invited by the ones who have kept you at a distance for so long. And that today, your people in this place, whatever our one more is, whatever our next step is, our one more time, we wouldn't let the fear keep us back anymore. Whatever embarrassment we think will come come over us or whatever whatever we think is going to happen in the negative sense. <laughs> let it be overcome by the truth of what you know. The truth of who you are and the truth of who we are in your sight, God. Thank you for loving us ferociously, passionately. Today, you just need to grow new roots, and those roots need to be exposed, and they need to be looked at, they need to, maybe you need to be replanted, because you've been scared, maybe you've been scared to replant, because maybe it's uncomfortable. Plants go through stress when they're replanted, but sometimes it's the best thing for them. If that's you in this place, it doesn't have to be a struggle that is the same as mine. It could be anything you've been dealing with. It could be a weight you've been carrying, a pain, a wound, a trauma, a habit. It could be an addiction. But would you just raise your hand so I can say a prayer for you? Be like, that's me. I want to I wanna take my next step. That's me. I want to I wanna follow that one more time God's leading me towards. Thanks for raising your hand over there. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks for raising your hand. I want to take that one more. Just put your hand. Thanks for raising your hand over there. I just want to take my one more time. One more step. Thank you for all you who raised your hand. And maybe you're a little on the shy side. That's all right. And in your heart, you're like, yeah, that's me too. God, thank you for all these hands that have been raised and the hearts that have been raised too. Oh, God, you, you, you see us in this place like no one else sees us, and you love us like no one else loves. Give us the courage to walk out that next step. Give us the courage to walk out that one more and to know you will be the provider because that's who you are. You can't stop being who you are. Thank you for this beautiful church, the beautiful work you're doing, God. We are honored to be a part of your work. TFH family, thank you for having me this morning. God bless all of you. Let's all stand today. I'm going to ask some of our prayer leaders to come forward. For anyone who would like to seal that word in your heart today, or maybe you need a safe person to confess to today. We've got some safe people here for you to confess to today and also for you to get the deliverance that you've been seeking. Maybe that was your answer to prayer today, that word, because you've been secretly in your mind, in your heart, and you've been asking the Lord, Lord, would you send somebody? Would you send somebody to help me break free of whatever it is that has trapped you and controlled you for too long. Or maybe you want prayer for anything under the sun, or you just want to spend a moment in God's presence, whether it's you want prayer or you want to spend a moment in God's presence, come forward if you'd like prayer. Let us pray with you and for you and see you experience the breakthroughs and the, the freedom that God is here to give you. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. There's only freedom. There's no guilt trip. There's only freedom. There, there, there's, there's no place for it to be hidden anymore. There's only freedom. There's only freedom from whatever it is that has helped you captive.
So as we sing this song, come forward and experience your breakthrough today. Get prayer. If you'd like to come forward and spend a moment in worship, you can do that. Or if you'd like to just stay there and, and spend a moment in worship, then lift your hands as we sing this song today. Or if you or if you need to go, then you go and you can go ahead and consider yourself dismissed. Join us for Discover in a few moments. For everybody else, we're gonna sing this song. Come forward for prayer. Join us in worship for the next few minutes. Go ahead, let's sing this song. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, TFH family, we are so glad you were able to join us for our online experience. We want to stay connected with you, and one way you can do that is to follow us on all socials at TFH and Thomas. Also, if you have never been to our Sunday services, I encourage you to come to our 10.30 a.m. services every Sunday. God bless.